<laughs> Let's get things started. I'm Andrea Johnson. I'm the Grant and Financial Education Coordinator for the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. This webinar today is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. First, a little something about the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. We license and regulate certain non-depository institutions, such as pawn shops, payday loan lenders, and registered creditors. We protect and safeguard you against abusive and deceptive lending practices. And we educate consumers and creditors like yourself about your rights and responsibilities. So much so that if you have a question about a contract, and you want to go over with someone, you can call our consumer assistance helpline and someone will go over those terms with you just to help you understand some things. Also, if you have any complaints or concerns about any of the industries that we license or regulate, please call the number that you see on your screen right now. And someone will be there to answer your question and guide you through anything you might have come across that is, um, you know, fraudulent. We also provide financial education at the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. This includes financial education through me, the financial education coordinator, information seminars and webinars. We used to do those in person. And of course, things have changed. Financial education materials, such as the handouts I have available for you today. And you can get those at occ.texas.gov under the consumer education uh, part of the website. We provide public service announcements and press releases, and we partner with other education-oriented organizations. And I like to just mention that what that means is we also provide our grant, the Texas Financial Education Endowment, and that goes every two years we provide funding to different organizations across the state of Texas who provide low, no-cost, financial education programs for K through 12 adult finance, adult financial education and financial coaching. So that's something we really like at the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. Today we're talking about credit and saving, and this is kind of gonna be a very high, you know, quick paced kind of thing because we're gonna be focused on the basics. This is geared towards maybe a younger audience, maybe you have a teen in your house, maybe you are transitioning from high school to college, you've gotten your first job, things of that nature, and you're looking forward to saving money and understanding what credit is and whether or not you have credit history. Today's goals, understanding the importance of good credit, that's a good one. And financial goals to save money. Do you have financial goals to save money? And that's really important. And we're going to talk about also how to achieve those financial goals. So my first question right off the bat is, how do you define credit? So, and this is just kind of make sure we're all on the same track. You know, is it money given to you that you don't have to pay back? Is it money you um, you borrow and you have to pay back? Recognition for a job well done. That's good. That's definitely good credit, right? And, uh, or is it the long scrolling text at the end of a movie? Well, for instance, yes. These, you know, those last three really are some idea of credit, technically. But it looks like everyone is paying attention today and everyone has an idea that credit is money you borrow to pay for things, but you must pay it back. And the must pay it back goes into that good credit versus bad credit. So why is it important to have good credit and why do you need it? Credit gives you the financial power and consumer power to qualify for borrowing money and perform for paying for goods and services over time. It means that you can be trusted to borrow money because you will be paying it back later. You've already set that uh, precedence that you are good for it, so to speak. It also helps you get a job, rent an apartment, buy a car, get a loan, set out payments, phone service, credit cards, get insurance. Um, you know, you might think, oh, I'll get a job. What do you need? Well, you know, there are going to be some careers out there that you might be interested in. My first job was working at a bank. And when you work at a bank, you they, they're they definitely looking at your credit because they want someone in there, you know, who's going to have some idea of finances. Good credit versus bad credit. 
this is what it means to lenders. And you might be thinking, well, it's kind of, you know, pigeon, pigeonholes me into a certain good versus bad. But lenders are looking at good credit in the sense that you are reliable in paying your bills on time. Um, companies are more willing to extend credit to you and you could receive lower pricing and that's great. Bad credit, on the other hand, could mean to a creditor or a lender that you are unreliable in paying your bills on time. You have a high debt to credit ratio. Your bills are paid late. Debts have been abandoned or you have filed for bankruptcy. Now, there are three different types of credit account categories, open, installment, and revolving. Credit cards are an example of a revolving credit account. This requires ongoing monthly payments depending on your balance. Interest rates can range anywhere from 14% to 30% and usually require a minimum payment. I want to point out that you should be, be, be aware of making minimum payments because if you owe $1,000 on a credit card and you're only making the minimum payment, let's say $20 a month, at the end of 18, and we're talking like 18% interest, at the end, it will take you almost eight years to pay it off, and your balance of $1,000 will end up costing you $1,880 in interest. So you have just almost doubled what you charged on that card originally. So you definitely want to try to not get into a habit of making the minimum payment if you can. Car loans are an example of an installment credit account. These are usually secured or unsecured, typically secured because the car is the security. There is a fixed amount of money you borrow and pay back at a set monthly amount. Credit scores play a big role in your interest rate. And this is also where you're going to have consumer confidence when you're going to make these purchases. And um, the better your credit score, the better your credit history, you are probably going to get better interest rates. Remember to read the entire application, including all the five in print. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want someone to just walk over these um, you know, applications with you, you can call the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner's Consumer Assistance Helpline and someone can walk you through that. So when it comes to credit cards, getting loans, um, there are going to be some fees. And these charges are for activities like reviewing your loan application or servicing your account. Some credit cards you'll notice will have an annual fee of $30 a year or, you know, some other type of annual fee. But that's just a fee for taking care of your account. Then you've got interest. And interest is the amount charged for lending you money. So we've got fixed rates and variable rates. And fixed rates are always better because you can rely on them always being consistent for the most part. Now, when it comes to loans, there's going to be secured and unsecured. Secured loans guarantee that it will be repaid by putting a lien of credit on an asset you own. Most popular that I think of is a car or your mortgage because these two things are physically tangible in your hand um, and if you don't pay for them, someone will come and take them away from you. An unsecured loan is given without any collateral, so but it, it typically will have a higher interest rate. An example of that, a good example of that is a student loan because after you've graduated, they can't take the knowledge out of your brain away from you if you don't pay your student loan. So you always have that in your head. Um, and so of course that makes it unsecured because they're giving you money on the basis that hopefully you will pay back. <clears throat> now, collateral is security you provide the lender, such as a home or car, and a guarantee is a form of collateral. For example, having a co-signer or a guarantor on a loan. So I know that my first car loan, I think my mom was my co-signer. And so that allowed me the opportunity to build credit by paying that car loan every month. And of course, I was not going to default because I did not want to upset my mother to that extent. There's also ways of establishing credit. You might have someone, you might be someone young or you might have someone young in your life that has no credit or maybe you're reestablishing your credit. 
you can always get a secured credit card. Now this is gonna use money you place into a security deposit account as collateral. $200 deposit, $200 credit limit. That security deposit gives lenders the confidence that you will pay them back, even if you have damaged or no credit history. So this is also good for repairing your credit. Secure cards are less risk for the lender. And there is a such thing as a prepaid debit card. Now you are using your own money to make purchases and you're not borrowing money from the issuer. So this is similar to a secured card, but you're using your very own money. How do lend lenders determine your credit worthiness? Creditors typically look at these three things, the three C's, your character, your capacity, and your capital. Your character is how you handled past debt obligations. Capacity is how much money, how much debt you can comfortably handle. And capital is your current assets. So, you know, real estate, savings, investment, um, items that are going to repay the debt if you can't. Now we're going to talk about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And this just kind of gives you a view of the rights and responsibilities you have if you feel that you have been taken advantage of. Under the Fair Reporting Act, Credit Reporting Act, you're entitled to a fair and accurate credit report. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act provides credit discrimination on the basis of prohibits credit discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, or because you get public assistance. The Credit Repair Organization Act prohibits untrue or misleading representation and requires certain affirmative disclosures in the offering or sale of credit repair services. This also bars companies offering credit repair services from demanding advance payment, requiring credit repair contract, and it requires that credit repair contracts be in writing and gives consumers certain contract cancellation rights. So if you're going, if you're trying to rebuild your credit, or establish your credit, there are things in place help protect you and always, always, always make sure you get things in writing. That's a big one. So what goes into a credit report and um, what is a credit report and what goes into one? A credit report tells lenders who you are and that means all of who you are. So any uh, current names you have, previous names you have, where you've lived, where you've worked, previous employers, previous addresses. It tells how much debt you have, whether you make your payments on time, and whether there is any negative information about you in public records, such as bankruptcies, for instance. And this is kind of what it's gonna look like. You are gonna have your name, you're gonna have you know, your address, your social, your date of birth, any employers that you've had, um, any potentially negative items, it's going to show your accounts in good standing. And when it's telling you about your accounts in good standing, it's going to talk about when you opened it. It's going to talk about how much you owe on it, the type of loan that it is, what your monthly payment is, and all of those things that go into every little detail of that account. It's also going to show in a credit report your inquiries. And inquiries are important. They stay on there for 24 months. So every time you see a credit application, and right now, you know, everyone's offering 70, you know, 50% off, 20% off. If you sign up for our credit cards, 0% uh, interest for so many months, if you get our credit card. Well, just remember, tis the season for credit inquiries. So as you keep applying for those different credit cards, you are getting pinged on your credit report, and we don't necessarily want that to happen. There are three credit reporting bureaus. They do not make credit lending decisions. They only maintain and compile the information into a credit report. If something is incorrect, you need to dispute it with both the creditor and the credit bureau. You can check your credit report once a year at annualcreditreport.com. You can also go to Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, and they will give you a free credit report. 
It is important to say that even if you are, you know, you have a teen in your house, you are a teen, and you're thinking, oh, well, I don't have any credit history, it's important to check your credit report to make sure someone else hasn't been using your information to apply for different things. I had a friend whose own mother did this to her, and it turned out when she went to purchase her next car that she found out, it was either a car or an apartment, that she had found out that her mother had been writing bad checks under her name, had bought a house under her name, rented apartments, bought cars, and it became a financial nightmare because all of this happened before she was even 18, before she even thought about going and doing any of these things that we do in order to establish our own, um, our own lives and move on. And so that's a big deal to keep things like that. Do you have any goals for saving money? Yes, no, maybe you haven't thought about it. Um, go ahead and tell me what you think because we are going to talk about saving money and the importance of saving money. And remember, if you have any questions this morning, if you want to go over things that you missed, um, if you have any advice, just go ahead and drop that into the chat box. You know, a lot of people use credit monitoring services um, and just feel free to kind of say whatever you feel like in the chat box and I will see if anyone else in the audience wants to hear about it. <laughs> so the good news today for us is that everyone who answered the survey says, yes, you have financial goals. And the reason why that's great is because financial goals are going to help you, one, build and work on your credit because you're not going to reach those financial goals, if they're big financial goals, having bad credit. So those financial goals will help you work on your credit, and they're also going to help you save for your future. And one of the things you need to do when we talk about saving is pay yourself first. Hmm, that might sound funny. You're like, oh, well, I got all these bills to pay. So what does it mean to pay yourself first? Put money in savings before you pay your bills. Why would you want to save money before you pay your bills? Well, it's easier to save money if you don't get used to spending it. I always like to think of if you get a job and you get a raise and you get an extra, um, let's say, $50 every paycheck. Take 20 of those $50 and stick it in a separate account that you don't frequently use. I have what I call my working account. My working account, the one that the paychecks go into, that we pay the bills out of, and then I have the savings account, which is in a totally different bank. And so the money I'm saving goes there and it helps with, um, you know, just any expenses that might come up. What are, think about what are some of the things you might want to save money for, like a car, a new phone, clothes, or giving to charity. That's something else you should also be budgeting for. And that's the thing, um, you know, this presentation, we're not really talking about budgeting, but when it comes to paying yourself first, it's gonna help to have some type of budget so that you can, um, know how much you are you can put into a savings account and won't hurt you because you definitely don't want to start falling into the cycle of using a credit card to make ends meet because you're trying to funnel so much money into a savings account. The importance of saving money, it helps you to become financially independent. It helps you to save for things you need and want. It prepares you for using financial products and it encourages sensible spending. For instance, a friend of mine recently launched her own business. Well, she's been saving money for years, and that was a big goal that she had. And she was so excited to share that with everyone over the holidays that she has launched this new business, and she's very excited. It's one of those, you know, companies where you go and you put the yard signs up in people's yards, you know, like, happy birthday, Andrea. Um, 
And so she's really excited about that, but that took a lot of saving and she became financially independent in order to do that and to open that business on her own. There are saving options. For instance, there are two basic ways to save money. Open a savings account, of course, and invest. When it comes to saving, you want to think about the interest. Interest is an amount of money financial institutions pay you keeping your money on deposit with them. It's expressed as a percentage. And it's calculated based on the money in your account. Let's say you, <laughs> let's say one of, one of the little cute examples is, you know, you stash a thousand dollars away in your mattress for a year. At the end of the year, it's still going to be a thousand dollars. It's not going to accrue interest. But if you put a thousand dollars in a savings account for a year and the bank applies 0.5% interest on the savings account, you will have one thousand five dollars at the end of the year so you it, it doesn't sound like a lot but you will get something back and that stuff adds up now when it comes to compound interest compound compounding is how your money can grow when you keep it in financial institutions that pay interest when they the when the bank compounds the interest in your account you earn money on previously paid interest in addition to the money in your account. So you're, with compounding interest, you're getting interest on top of interest. And so that's good. I'm in Austin, so uh, seasonal allergies are up right now. So cedar fever is uh, show it rearing its ugly head at us and that's why I'm coughing so if my mic cuts out and you see me take water that's what the problem is. Interest can be compounded daily, monthly, or annually. Not all savings accounts are created equal so you need to decide and find out which, which one would work best. Sorry about that, everyone. So the bank compounds the interest in your account. You earn money on previously paid interest, which is what I just mentioned, in addition to the money in your account. Not all savings accounts are created equal, and this is because interest can be compounded daily, monthly, or annually. As you see in this chart, if you start the balance of your account with $2,000, and the annual interest rate is 10%, in a bank that doesn't have compounding interest, after five years, you'll have $3,000. Uh, you know, it's still an extra money. Now, when it comes to compound interest, and it compounds monthly, 12 years, uh, 12 months, sorry, and <laughs> for five years, you will have earned three, you'll have grown an extra $1,290. So that's even better. Now, let's say 10 years down the road and you kept this money sitting there. Well, now you've more than doubled what you originally put in the account. So compound interest is gonna make a big difference depending on how long you let it sit in the account. And that may be easier said than done. You know, if you got uh, unforeseen expenses that come about that you need to take You know, you, that might kind of set back a little, but just leave it in there as much as you can. Annual percentage yield. This is the amount of interest you will earn on a yearly basis expressed as a percentage. It includes the effect of compounding and should be used to compare savings products and not the interest rate. You also want to set financial goals when it comes to saving money. You want to have short-term goals and long-term goals and even some intermediate goals. This chart, I've used this chart before and there's an intermediate on there. Long-term goals, short-term goals are going to be less than a year. Intermediate goals are one to four years. 
and long-term goals are four years or more. And short-term goals could include, you know, an emergency savings account. It can include, you know, when we all get back to normal here in Austin, ACL tickets. Um, maybe you want to buy someone a birthday gift. That's a very short-term goal, but it's a lot easier to save up for that money, and you know when someone's birthday is. It's a lot easier to save up for that money, or maybe, you know, do some off-season shopping. That also helps. Intermediate goals, um, maybe you want to pay down a vehicle. Uh, extend a vacation or major home repairs. And then long-term goals are going to be, um, you know, maybe paying off or buying a car, uh, a down payment on a house, things of that nature. I think of ways to achieve your financial goals. And this is really important. Think about what your goals are financially and you know improving your credit building a budget things of that nature establishing credit those can be financial goals as well but we want to write them down to make them visible be specific and make them achievable so and when i say write them down i mean really take out a piece of paper and write them down and see them somewhere in your house where you can walk past them and go oh i don't need those new boots I want XYZ. Write down how much it will cost and not just the monetary value of how much it will cost. Consider your support system, you know, your spouses, your friends, your, you know, your parents, grandparents, anyone that is in your bubble. Think about what sacrifices they might have to make. That's not financial sacrifices. Um, I, for instance, you know, I cut back on eating out and my husband loves to eat. Out. He could eat out every day, all day. And I have to say no, because it goes, okay, well, do you want this or do you want to go and spend 30 bucks at a restaurant? And that's even probably like fast food restaurants. Communicate your goals, rank your goals and share them with your family members. So if you've got several financial goals, Write them down, share them with the people in your household. So when you run into a temptation, they can also help you to avoid the temptation. Establish a timeline. Let's say you want to save a thousand dollars for a car payment, a car down payment over 18 months. You're gonna have to set aside roughly $56 a month. <clears throat> and so that is just something you need to be looking ahead and you know putting that money aside you also want to be flexible with yourself and keep your eye on the prize if something happens and you you know have to take a little nugget out of your savings and put it towards something else that's just really what you have to do um you know for instance my mom likes to have savings accounts for all grandkids and i know that at one point, um, money was paid out for uh, some kind of medical expense, and that money has slowly been put back into the account. But that was a, a minor, that was an, an important step back, but it's still, you know, deducted from what was being saved. But that's okay. You just you plug away and keep making it up as you move along. The key takeaways today are to monitor your credit by checking your credit report. Use credit wisely in order to build good credit and a credit history and build a savings account and one that hopefully works for you. Now, today's presentation has been kind of uh, short, but that's kind of what it was today. It's just a real fast paced, you know, basics. Hopefully, you know, if you go back and watch this, you could share it with someone. I'm Andrea Johnson. I am the Grant Financial Education Coordinator for the Office of Consumer Credit Commissioner. You can find us on Facebook at Texas Financial Education Endowment and on Twitter at Financial Ed Texas. I hold webinars every Thursday at 10 a.m. And well, except for next week. Next week is the Christmas holiday, so I will not be holding a webinar that, that week. Um, but feel free to check back in with me in the new year. I hope everyone has safe and healthy holidays. 